It's a special day because I'm filming this on the 1st of February, 2024. And I picked this car up on the 1st of February, 2014, after having ordered it in November, 2013. It's my car, but it's also my learner car that I use to teach people to drive in. And I've had it for 10 years and done 205,000 miles in it. Sometimes people ask, why do I say it's a 2014 car when it's got 6.3 on the number plate? And that's because 6.3 goes to the end of February 2014. But anyway, in 10 years and 205,000 miles, a lot of that is teaching people to drive, what's gone wrong and why have I kept it so long? It's the time of year where cars get dirty in about the same amount of time it takes Usain Bolt to run the 100 meters and it's dirty at the moment, and I either have time to make this video or clean the car. So I'm gonna make this video and show you a picture of when it's clean-ish. Apollo blue is the color, and that was an easy choice when I was ordering the car. There are two reactions I get when people notice the mileage on this car. One is surprise, they didn't know cars could go that far, and the other is the complete opposite end of that. They're like, oh, that's nothing these days. But both aren't true, yes. Cars can go 200,000 miles and a lot further. That is true, but it's not nothing either. If you've ever done 200,000 miles in a car yourself, you'll know what I mean. It's a long time. But the mileage of this car does not represent its wear. Not one bit. Because you can have easy miles and hard miles. And this car has had hard miles. It's had people get into it and use it to learn how to drive. They're not using the clutch and the gears to get somewhere. They're using them to learn how to use them. Sitting in a car park, learning how to reverse in hot conditions with the air conditioning on and the under bonnet temps going up as there's no airflow as you're going backwards trying to reverse. It's not good for the car. Most cars that do 200,000 miles are likely going to do that within 5,000 hours. In fact, most cars don't get anywhere near 5,000 hours of use before they're scrapped. This car though, this car has had 19,000 hours of use. A lot of that is by people who don't know how to drive. That's a lot of wear. That's a lot of time sitting on the seats. I'm gonna split this down into two parts for things that have gone wrong. Things that have gone wrong under warranty and things that have gone wrong after the warranty. Bear in mind though that if this car was driven on the motorway, let's say it had an average speed of 40 miles per hour in its life so far, 19,000 hours would be closer to 800,000 miles. And when I got this car, it was a new design, new chassis, new engines, they were still learning. There were some parts that needed an update. You could argue that should not be the case, but that nearly always is the case. When you buy a new model that's just been released, things go wrong quite often. Okay, so first year, nothing went wrong. But then at 30,000 miles, steering rack needed replacing. It was notchy and knocking. Hasn't returned since they replaced the part. I believe it was an updated part. Funny thing is, that was during a time when I did not allow dry steering. I didn't dry steer myself and I did not let my pupils dry steer and I got a failed steering rack. And not long after that, I gave up with avoiding dry steering. I find it so much easier just to allow it for teaching and for myself and I've not had any problems since. Okay, moving on, 40,000 miles, this volume thing, volume wheel, that failed, replaced under warranty. 41,000 miles, the battery failed, sudden failure, the cell split, engine wouldn't start in Tesco's, had to be recovered. 60,000 miles, loads of things replaced. LCD screen, it would always like press things without me pressing anything, so it would change the radio station, etc. And it would do it when it was cold. And they replaced the screen, thinking it was the screen, but it still did it. Heater fan started squeaking, 60,000 miles. Third brake light, 60,000 miles. Ignition coil failed, didn't fail. They broke an ignition coil when replacing a spark plug, 60,000 miles, they kept doing that. When you remove the ignition coils on this car, wait for the engine or get the engine hot first, then they come out easily. If you try to remove them when the engine is cold, they snap. I've not broken one yet, but when it was serviced by the main dealer, they kept breaking them, but they did 
replace them under warranty though, because the car was under warranty when they were servicing it. Then I started servicing it myself. Steering software update, that improved it a bit because it used to just get light randomly sometimes, not for low speed, just randomly, which is a bit weird. That made it feel better, not hugely, but enough that I noticed it was a bit strange. 63,000 miles, new cylinder head. Now, when I got this car, it used to burn oil and it burnt more and more oil. And by 60,000 miles, the dealer agreed, it's too much, okay, we're gonna do something. They tested it. They found that the oil was leaking past the stem seal on the valve and being burnt in the engine. They replaced the cylinder head. They said they were aware that there is a problem as in the cylinder head had been changed slightly so it didn't have that problem. And since they put that new cylinder head on, no oil usage, tiny, tiny bit. You don't even need to really top it up between services. You wouldn't need to, I do, but I like to keep it near the max, but I don't think you would need to, it would last. Um, yeah, that solved the problem. It's the original engine, original, I think they call it a short block, but the cylinder head itself was replaced at 63,000 miles. 75,000 miles, they broke two more ignition coils, but they replaced those. And at 75,000 miles, they replaced those under warranty, I mean. And at 75,000 miles, the wing mirror motor on that side that folds the motor in, that failed. Now, I'm gonna have a little break for my voice, and then I'll do what happened after the warranty. So, after the warranty, 95,000 miles, left climate control flat motor failed. Had to replace that myself, wasn't expensive. 98,000 miles, fuel flap lock failed. So I couldn't fill up with fuel, couldn't open the door to fill up with fuel. Once I did manage to get it open, I didn't close it, then I replaced it. Wasn't expensive again. 100,000 miles, clutch slave cylinder failed. It's got the original master cylinder though, which surprises me. Um, 107,000 miles, near side rear shock. Don't think it needed replacing. These shocks do get a bit of misting, but it was advised that I replaced it and I did, although I didn't notice a problem, couldn't feel a problem. 118,000 miles, right climate control flat motor failed. Again, very cheap to replace. Uh, I actually replaced them with second hand parts. I think that one was from an Audi TT. They all have the same flat motors, all the VW cars, VW say it, Audi, Skoda. Um, 123,000 miles, alternator failed, so the battery wasn't charging. 126,000 miles, water leak from the water pump, not something you do with the cam belt on this car, it's on the other side of the engine, I think it runs off the exhaust cam, and that started leaking, so, well, I guess it will start leaking again when it gets to 250,000 miles, if I have it that long, if that's how long it took before. 130,000 miles, new battery, wasn't really needed, but started getting a bit weak, and I do replace batteries once they start to get a bit weak, I don't like having a weak battery. 145,000 miles, air conditioning compressor failed. Wasn't a big failure. It turned itself off a couple of times and I had to turn the engine off and back on again to get it to run, which was telling me there's something wrong with that compressor. Uh, there was gas in the system, wasn't leaking. So I took a punt, replaced that. And luckily that was the problem. Um, problem didn't come back, still on that same compressor. It wasn't expensive though. The alternator and the air conditioning compressor the car was still relatively young back then, so there was plenty of new examples about, and I managed to find second-hand items off nearly new cars for not much money. I think the alternator cost me £60, and the air conditioning compressor cost me a similar amount, and it didn't cost that much to fit either of them. So it was worth a, worth a go, worth a punt, even though it wasn't guaranteed to, be, to solve the problem. 153,000 miles will not blast the intake valves. They do need the, these intake valves do need cleaning. If you don't clean them, they get clogged up and you lose power. It's DuraClean now. Um, so the cylinder head was replaced at 63,000 miles, but I had the valves cleaned at 153. So that's 90,000 miles. Uh, so far they're on about 50,000 miles and I am noticing a little bit of a drop in power. I don't, I don't think I'll leave it 90,000 miles again. Uh, so I'll get them done sooner because you do notice when you get those valves cleaned, the power is, wow, I've been missing all this power for how long? Of course, when I had the new cylinder head fitted, 
that came with new clean valves anyway so that was kind of the first clean even though i didn't have it have it cleaned i had clean valves at 63,000 miles uh, 166,000 miles new front suspension control arms they were a little bit creaky the bushes were a little bit creaky and they're cheap so i thought i'd just replace the arms complete with bushes and ball joints get the whole thing done both sides in one go not very expensive and the creaking went away only creaked when it was very cold over speed bumps once the engine got warm that warmed up the bushes and the creaking went away uh, it was never advised on an MOT that was just something I did new oil sump at 166,000 miles didn't need an oil sump really oh well, it kind of did the sump plug I was buying I wasn't buying the genuine one and I should have been I think because I think the washer on the plug I was buying wasn't sealing properly and I don't know why it took me so long to think of this and just get the genuine plug with a genuine washer but I had to keep tightening it more and more to stop it leaking to the point where I tightened it I thought that doesn't feel good and I was getting to like 80 newton meters i know it's 25 newton meters for that plug but it was leaking so i had to keep getting tighter and tighter didn't want to undo it and drop all the oil and do another oil change um so yeah i did about three services i think i can't remember how many services till i realized actually why am i buying these aftermarket plugs from euro car parks i just should just go to the main dealer and get the genuine one 172,000 miles the fold motor on this mirror failed so they've both failed 181,000 miles, new battery again. Again, not really needed, but a bit weak, so I replaced it anyway. 188,000 miles, steering wheel stalks, replaced them. Was that that long ago? I thought that was quite recent, 188,000 miles. I suppose it's, yeah, a bit, 17,000 miles ago. Hmm. Feels like a few months ago, but that's a bit longer. Yeah, the cruise control failed, so I had to get new stalks to replace the cruise control switch that failed and then 190,000 miles left temperature flap failed for the air conditioning so I've had three of those motors that control the flaps in the air conditioning fail all different by the looks of things 190,000 miles my air oil separator for the positive crankcase ventilation system I noticed it weeping a little bit of oil dripping onto the oil filter had that replaced uh, solved the problem with a genuine part, learnt my lesson, buy genuine parts. I really do believe that that's the way to go. Um, 200,000 miles, new boot struts, 200,000 miles, boot strut, oh no, the boot stopper fell off. When you close the boot, it's a little bit of rubber that just stops it and that fell off. So I've got a new one them. it's like five pounds or something. 202,000 miles, this was expensive. A lot of these parts I've said have been really cheap especially as a, some of them I've bought secondhand, like the these are secondhand, because I found them in such good condition. I just thought, what's the point of buying new? They, they're basically new. But this was expensive, this roof liner. £675 it cost me. That annoyed me because it started to sag when it was under warranty. And I, I, I noticed it, but I never did anything about it because I just kept forgetting. I never noticed until I sat in the back and I didn't sit in the back much. So then I'd forget about it. And it got so bad that I was like noticing it when I was sitting here and I was like, ah, I need to do something about that. Uh, so yeah, 675 pounds for a new one of these. Uh, 202,000 miles again, boot release badge. Started to get stuck open, use the, the boot badge, the badge, the set badge on boot to open it. That got stuck open, uh, replaced that. I can't remember how much that was. I think it was like 80 pounds. Um, I replaced the rear wiper motor with a second-hand unit because the new ones were 200 but I found a second-hand one for £30 because it was buzzing. How long it will last I don't know but it's so easy to replace. Again I thought it's 30 quid, it's worth giving it a go and that solved that issue. 202,000 miles, this wing mirror adjuster here, you can't see that so I'll put some b-roll in of that thing here, that's for adjusting your mirrors. That didn't fail completely, but the signal was weak. And this car has a dipping function. When you put it in reverse, the wing mirror over there dips so you can see the curb. 
and every so often it would undip itself and then dip itself again and up and undip itself and dip itself again because the signal from this was weak it didn't know it was on l it has to be on l for that function to work replace that again quite cheap quite easy to replace take the door card off take it out put a new one back in solve the problem and it was starting to crack as well so i've got a nice new one now and I think from now on, I'm probably, if I keep this car much longer, I'll just buy new parts because these cars are getting older now. It's harder to find good secondhand parts. When I first got the car and when it was not under warranty, it was still really young. Good secondhand parts were easy to find, not so much now. And the thing I haven't done yet that I'm about to do probably this weekend is the passenger seat belt. I'll show you that now. You can see where it's worn and it's actually an MOT advisory which brought it to my attention. I knew it was a little bit worn there. I've noticed that for a while um, but now it's been an MOT advisory. I'm going to replace it. Bought one from Say It, £209 I think. Shouldn't take me more than a couple of hours to replace. And that's all the things that have failed excluding things like brake pads and air conditioning regasses things that wear not wear and tear items there are actual they're actually failures things that have failed now i'll talk about the wear and tear items and i'll start in the cabin because this is where a lot of the wear and tear happens these seats get sat in a lot not so much these days because i'm only doing about 10,000 miles a year now that was last year the year before that was 14,000 miles so not so many miles whereas at my peak i was doing close to 30,000 miles a year in this car so these are the second seats. Both times I've replaced them with second-hand units from nearly new cars that have been written off. Uh, I replaced these ones at 146,000 miles. These ones are from the facelift model and I replaced the original ones at 100,000 miles. So they didn't actually last that long. So 100,000 miles to 146, I think it was, did I say that, or 147? It's about 50,000 miles those ones lasted, but these facelift ones are lasting a lot longer. The seat cushion slightly firmer and what was happening with the pre-facelift model is the seat cushion was sort of like disintegrating at the bottom underneath and it had it's got this fake lever here but the pre-facelift had fake lever on the inside of the bolsters as well and that would crack. This one doesn't have that fake lever on the inside and it's not cracking which is probably why it's lasting longer and the firmer seats as well don't seem to be disintegrating because I'm not seeing loads of foam under the seat when I'm hoovering up. This is the third steering wheel. This one's brand new, but I got it off eBay brand new. I can see it's brand new. It was in its proper packaging um, and it feels so good. This is the pre-facelift steering wheel, the one that the car originally came with. The first time I replaced the steering wheel, it was with a facelift one. I managed to find a second hand good condition facelift one which is thicker chunkier and smoother lever didn't like that as much the lever didn't last as long and because it was thicker it just didn't feel as nice to hold when I got this steering wheel straight away I was like oh yeah this is better so I much prefer the pre-facelift steering wheel really happy with that it's transformed the car having a new wheel instead of having it shiny and I know you can clean the shine off I can do that I know how to do that but the lever started wearing away here and you're starting to see like or bits of it coming off again it's got a lot of hours of use second gear knob brand new part didn't mess about with that all the second hand gear knobs are worn anyway and it's not that expensive it was a hundred pounds and by the way this new steering wheel on ebay was 150 pounds but say it wanted 700 pounds so i was very reluctant to pay that 700 pounds and i did look every so often to see if a new one would come up on ebay and it did Handbrake I've replaced once with a second hand uh, unit. It's starting to wear a little bit around the edges again, uh, but considering this cost me 50 pounds and how long it's last me, I'm happy with that. I got someone to re-trim the armrest because this, I mean, you can see that here, this was fake leather and it started cracking and they do that in these cars, they all do that. So I've got real leather on there and that's been fine ever since. So we've got seats, armrest, handbrake, gear knob, steering wheel. They're all, oh, and carpet. There's a little hole appearing down here and a little hole appearing on the other side down there as well where the mat doesn't cover. And the carpet was starting to look a bit threadbare from being hoovered so many times. It was no longer black, bits of it were starting to go a little bit white where the, the hair 
you could call it hair, I don't know what it is, hair or the carpet was starting to wear away. 50 quid, again, for a very good condition used unit from a, a written off car, I assume, off eBay. Uh, stripped the interior, fitted it, and that really made the interior look a lot better. At the moment, the interior is in stunning condition. There really isn't any signs of wear at all. I do like it in here, just on the edge of the handbrake lever, there's a slight bit of wear there. I might replace that, I might not, I don't know. I haven't decided yet, it's not bothering me too much. So I am very happy in here. It does feel like a new car. And although you will say that's a lot of things to replace, just think of how many times those things have been held, how many, how many hours those things have been sat in. They're not really designed to last that long. That's a lot longer than most cars ever do. And how much money I've spent on keeping this interior in tip-top condition, I am very pleased with the results. And yes, what we got here is full link. See that here? Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. That cost about £600 to get that installed. That is from a 2020 car. They made this car until 2020. So again, car gets crashed. All the good components get stripped from that car. That's how they recycle cars and they sell those components on. I got myself one of those and a clever person to install it who can actually do the component protection and make it work with this car as if it would from factory. So really, that's really bought this... Um, interior into this decade i really enjoy having android auto and if i couldn't have that i would have replaced this car by now that is a certain because i got that october 2021 i think yeah i think it's 21 october 21 yes it was then and at that point i was thinking of changing this car and that was the main reason why i wanted to change it so that 600 pounds breathed a lot of life and more longevity into this car. Front discs and pads lasted 35,000 miles for the genuine items. I replaced them with genuine and they lasted 35,000 miles again. I thought this isn't long enough. So I fitted padded discs and pads and they lasted 70,000 miles. The rear genuine ones lasted 130,000 miles. I replaced them with padgeds. I haven't had to replace them since. Um, so my second set of padded discs and pads at the moment, currently they're on getting close to 70,000 miles, 65 at the moment, and they still look like they've got about 30% worth of material left. So they last a lot longer than the genuine items, even though they are cheaper. So although I think it's good to buy genuine, sometimes there are exceptions and some of the aftermarket products can be better. The clutch friction material lasts about 200,000 miles. And what I mean by that is it seems to wear by about 20% every 40,000 miles. I've measured it several times. I've never actually gone 200,000 miles on the same clutch though. And that's because after 40,000 miles of learners changing gear, sometimes a little bit harshly, the damper mechanism within the friction disc starts to get a little bit loose. So if the engine is idling on a hot day, particularly on a hot day, although it does it all the time, you notice it more on hot days. If you're in neutral with the clutch up and the engine's idling, you get this. And after investigation, that's what I found it to be. You can see the friction disc on the input shaft of the gearbox is exactly the same noise. It's just rattling a little bit. So that was bothering me. So I was replacing the clutch when that rattle started to happen because a clutch kit on this is 300 pounds and it's four or five hours labor to do. It's not the end of the world. Um, but then I started noticing loads of other, ca the other cars, other people have it and they just put up with that noise. And I was thinking maybe I should put up with that noise as well instead of spending that money. So that's what I'd done. I haven't replaced it since 130,000 miles. I'm sure it's not worn, it does tick now. It started ticking again at about 170 as it does on time at 40,000 miles. It's a bit annoying because I'm making a video on a hot day with the air conditioning on, the engine idling. You do sometimes just hear that little ticking in the background. Push the clutch down, tick goes away. A lot of people accuse it to be the input shaft of the gearbox, but I know it's not because I've replaced the clutch several times and the tick went away for 40,000 miles and still it starts to get play again. And I've compared new with old genuine items as well. And you can see 
the damper, me the damper mechanism on the used item is looser than the new items. That's where I think that ticking is coming from if you have that in your Seat Layan or VW Golf or Audi A3 or Skoda Octavia. And I'm sure probably other models suffer from a similar thing too. A part of this clutch that doesn't wear so well is the release bearing. And that's because the release bearing is active when the clutch pedal is pressed down. And as people use this car to learn how a clutch works and learn how to change gear, this clutch gets used many more times per mile than a normal car. So when the clutch has been off of the car and out and I've seen it, the release bearing has been the most worn item. It gets a groove in it and it gets a bit of play in it as well. So this release bearing has currently been in here for 75,000 miles. It's the original OEM part made by Saks. It's not squealing yet, it's got no problems. That can be a clue when the release bearing is starting to fail. When you put your foot on the clutch, it goes as that bearing starts to spin and it's failing. So it's not doing it at the moment. It seems to be working fine. The clutch feels all right. I think the master cylinder could do a replacing. Sometimes that creaks a little bit as you push it down. But how long it will last, I don't know. I kind of wish I never replaced the clutch early like I did before, because then I would have actually seen how long it actually lasts. Surely it would have failed by now, it wouldn't be original, and wait until it fails instead of replacing it so early. Maybe I should have done that, it's kind of what I'm doing now. I replace the cam belt every four years or 60,000 miles, whatever comes first, and so far it's been 60,000 miles that has come first. It says in the service schedule that it should last the life of the vehicle, but I don't recommend that. It does say after 120,000 miles, check it every 10,000 miles for signs of wear. But last time the cam belt was changed, it was fraying slightly on the edge and the idler pulley was slightly bent as well. For the cost of a cam belt or the cam belt kit and the labor to do it, which isn't a lot in this car, I think usually the kit and the labor comes to about 300 pounds. It's well worth that security for four years of knowing the engine will probably be fine because that is what is gonna probably kill this engine. I don't think many things are gonna to happen to this engine that will destroy it other than the cam belt failing. I think it will outlast the car if I replace the cam belt and obviously change the oil and the filters. Now I know I said 300 pounds is not a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but for changing a cam belt, it's not a lot of money. Some cars require you to take the engine out. And this car in general, Anything you ever really need to do to it doesn't take many hours. It's quite a cheap, easy car to work on. Servicing in this one is long life, which means every 18,800 miles or two years, whatever comes soonest. And I have been doing that, yes. And it's lasted. And when that oil pan was off, it was clean. I was expecting to see some kind of sludge around the edges and it was clean oil and a clean pan. I used the proper oil, the Long Life Free, a Kia C3 with a correct viscosity, and it seems to last that amount of time. I think it does depend on the engine you have. If you have a Toyota, say, from 2008 to 2013, those petrol ones, some of them had low tension piston rings and leaving the oil every 10,000 miles would cause them to gum up and then you get oil, burning oil. But this car, changing the oil at 18,800 miles or between 18 and 19,000 miles, has actually worked and it's been fine so far and it's not burning oil now it's strong and from what i've seen it's also clean the last two services weren't that long though the last two services were 14,000 and 10,000 miles and that's because i didn't do as many miles that year before i was getting through like 20,000 miles in seven months or something and but i don't like it to go longer than a year so a year's up I'm gonna have a good look around the engine, good look at the suspension, and whilst I'm there, I may as well change the oil. I regas the air conditioning every two years, not because it needs it, but just because you do get a bit of seepage. No system is perfectly sealed, and if you make sure you've got the correct pressure in there, it's gonna work better. And I try to change the brake fluid every two years, but it doesn't seem to get water in it. Last time I measured it, it's about two years old now, 0.5% water. Give you an idea, new is usually 0.25% water in my experience from measuring it, and you should replace it by two, three, definitely by 4% water. I've never paid for a 10 pound scratch and shine quick local car wash. And as a result, when I clean the paintwork, it comes up gleaming. There's no scratches or swell marks. And the original paint on this car is strong. 
If you get a slight scratch, I don't recommend getting it repaired if you can live with that scratch because the original paint lasts a long time and is not prone to stone chips. After 190,000 miles, the front, the front bumper, I could probably count on my fingers how many stone chips there were. There wasn't many, it was in brilliant condition. Someone hit my car in a car park, drove off and didn't leave a note. Scuff on the front bumper, I had to pay someone to paint the front bumper. They did it, brilliant job, looked fantastic. Could not tell the color difference between the bumper, the bonnet and the wing. So I was very happy with that. But within a matter of months, it had more stone chips than my bumper that had 190,000 miles had. And they were quite big ones as well. It seems to chip a lot more easily. And my Mazda does as well. My Mazda MX-5, that is more prone to stone chips than this car. So if you can live with a small scratch, I don't recommend getting it repainted because the original paint on this car, I'll keep that as long as you possibly can. If you're interested in how much the car cost, well, I've got the original order form here, ordered on the 25th of November, 2013. And the price is 19,915 pounds. And I've got 1,000 pounds of dealer contribution towards that. So it's actually 18,915 pounds. Most cars are more than that now. That doesn't buy you a lot of new car these days. Options wise, um, I went for the Space Saver Spare. So these options were included in that price I just said. £80 for the spare wheel, £208 for Say It Sound, brilliant sound system. Technology pack was included, which is the LED lights and the upgraded infotainment system. Apollo blue metallic paint, £412, and the LED illumination, the interior illumination, just to make it look a bit more modern, that was £50. Those prices are plus VAT, but they're included in that total price that I've said. Now, I went for the FR 1.4 TSI. I wanted the independent rear suspension, but the two engines that come with that suspension weren't for me. One was a diesel, and I didn't want diesels anymore, I wanted petrol, because diesels were costing me too much money in aggravation due to diesel particulate filters and dual mass, dual mass flywheels. I know petrols also have dual mass flywheels, but this car doesn't, solid mass flywheel, and it doesn't have a diesel particulate filter, and it was 2,000 pounds cheaper. When I start adding all that up, and the fact I wanted a petrol anyway, made sense. So the suspension on this is still all right, I still actually think it's quite good. I, I do like it, but the independent suspension is better. But the engine was my favorite out of all of them, by far. The 1.8 turbo petrol only had the same performance as this up to 4,000 revs. It's only once you went above 4,000 revs that the 1.8 petrol turbo petrol was better, but used a lot more fuel. This one used less fuel, but gave you more or less the same performance in most of your driving, most of the time you're less than 4,000 revs. It's a clever engine, it's not very big or heavy. I think the whole thing weighs 100 kilos and I like clever. It's, and that, that 100 kilos I think is including like ancillaries like air conditioning. And one way they've made it lighter is by not having balancer shafts. Most four cylinder engines need these balancer shafts, they add weight, spinning mass to make it smooth. They managed to make it smooth by taking bits of metal, bits of material out of the crankshaft to balance it. So it's balanced by removing material instead of adding material. And I think that's genius and it works. It's smooth. It produces loads of torque and power claimed. It's 140 PS of, of power at 4,000 revs to 6,000, 2,000 revs of peak power there and peak torque is claimed at 250 newton meters from 1,500 revs to I believe 3,000 or 3,500 revs. In reality, peak it gets to its peak more like 2,000 revs though from what I can see. I've measured it after having the valves cleaned and it was actually 150 PS or 140 brake or 147 brake horsepower and 297 newton meters of torque. So it actually produces more power and torque than is claimed. That is usually the case with VW, say it is VW. I think the reason why they do that is because they're thinking how much power is it gonna have after a few years of use? 
and that's kind of what they're aiming for. So it's kind of like, like that's the minimum power plus a bit more. So they're thinking about usage. I'm assuming that, I don't know that for a fact, but I do know VW engines, they generally produce more power than they claim. And yes, it does lose power over time, but once I clean those valves, those intake valves, the power goes straight back up again. So I'm very happy with this small 1.4 turbocharged petrol engine. It feels a lot faster than the figures suggest. If you're interested in how I bought it, well, I bought it on finance. It was HP, higher purchase. That's basically a secured loan on the car. I traded in my old learner car. They gave me, says here actually, 4,750 pounds for that. Um, I did see it on their forecourt for 6,500 uh, pounds, but that's normal, that's, that's how the system works. And I gave them some deposit and then I paid monthly for 36 months at 0% interest. It's a new day today and a new t-shirt. I ran out of daylight yesterday and also I was starting to lose my voice a little bit. I was talking a bit too much yesterday in between doing these videos and lessons. So hopefully not much longer left in this video now. I think it's already been quite long enough, but I've had the car a long time, so there's a lot to talk about. What I wanna talk about now is why I've kept it so long. I've got a couple of notes here I've made. Well, the first reason why I kept it longer than three years, because when it was three years old, I'd paid it off and I was looking at replacing it. And I've been looking at replacing it ever since. It was seven years and I still haven't replaced it. But the first reason was the handbrake. The new Leon had an electronic handbrake. And although I like electronic handbrakes because they disengage and engage automatically, so it's one less thing for me to do. And I don't particularly enjoy using the handbrake, so it doing it itself is fine with me. Most people I teach to drive, the vast, vast majority of people I teach to drive, I teach manual. I can teach auto, but I choose to teach manual. So I have a manual car. They're gonna have a manual car and they're very likely gonna have a manual handbrake. And when I'm teaching people to drive, I can see it does take a few goes for them to get used to it. So I think it's important for as long as I can to try and give them experience with a manual handbrake whilst they're likely to have a manual handbrake as their, or in their first car. Other reasons, say it sound. It's such a good system. It really, I can't obviously show you it because it's not gonna come across on microphone and copyright, but out of all the cars I get in and drive, I think this has the best sound system. Uh, and that's comparing it with like a Bang & Olufsen system in an Audi as well. I think this is better. That might just be my ears, it might be my opinion, but it's fantastic, it's clear. It's not too much bass, but there is enough. And you can turn it up more if you do want loads of bass. I tend to just keep things zero, everything zero, and just listen to it how I think the artist has intended to, because the system's good, I don't need to boost anything. Brilliant system, not expensive. 208 pounds plus fat, that sound system, compared to other sound systems in cars that you can upgrade to. I think it's one of the cheapest ones I've seen and it's way better than the Bose system in my MX-5 and uh, better than most other systems I try. I think I've said enough about that. Now moving on, climate control is really good. It's got a split cooling system. I think that's quite normal these days, but when I got this car, not many cars had that system as far as I was aware which means you get heat in the cabin really quickly. Having two circuits, it just heats up the little circuit when you first turn the engine on, so that gets hot quick, and you get heat in the cabin quick, so that's nice. But also, it just seems to keep me more comfortable, more than most other climate control systems I've used. The auto setting works well. The split climate control works well. Often, my pupil will have a lower temperature than me, and I don't notice until I get back in this side of the car and I start driving, I think it's cold here. Oh, they've got it on 17. So it does work and it helps for comfort. I've got sun sensors at the front, so it does take into account the sunlight, which side of the car it's shining on. It adapts the climate control on each side based on that. Um, and I can get a good particulate filter for it as well. So the cabin has cleaner air that filters out, uh, where well it should filter out a lot of the particulates from car exhaust fumes. Brilliant climate control system, feel comfortable. My other half's old Citroen that had dual zone climate control, but it just wasn't the same. My feet always felt cold, whereas my upper body felt a bit too warm. But this one is lovely. Air conditioning works brilliantly as well. Um, 
no rust. That's more of a more recent thing that gives me more faith in this car because a lot of cars by this age, you look under them, 10 years old, and they have quite a bit of rust on them, but this car, barely any, very little rust, even on the powder coated areas, they're holding up pretty well. I think if I wanted to, I could keep this car for 30 years if I wanted to. I'm not going, I doubt I'll do that, just because technology. And that's what really pushes me to want to upgrade it. It's, it's because I want an upgrade. When something comes about that is significantly better than this, I think, ah, oh, now that is actually a better car. That's gonna want me, or gonna make me, sorry, make me want to change it. I'm not changing it because I think it's falling apart because looking at it, the meat and potatoes of it, the engine and the chassis seem strong and they seem like they've got a lot of life in. I'm surprised how little rust there is on the uh, chassis and the powder coated subframes, etc., underneath the car. Headlights, well, they were brilliant when I first got this car. And I think they're still as good as they were when I got them, but technology has moved on. The headlights in my MX-5 are way better and the headlights in my other half's Corolla are also way better because they have that adaptive technology where they can give you more light, whereas this is kind of dumb. It's either full beams or not full beams. When you're on full beams, yes, it's bright, but how often do I actually get to use it? When I'm driving my MX-5, I can see into the bushes. So if any animals are starting to come running from the left side, I'm gonna notice them. In this car, I just feel like I can't see as well when I'm driving at night time in this car. So I don't really drive it as much at night anymore which is probably one of the reasons why the mileage on this is lower now as well, because I don't use it as much for personal use. I really generally just use this for lessons and doing these videos. Uh, something about the headlights, quite normal these days, as a car gets older, headlights, the plastic lens suffers from crazing, which is loads of little cracks in the plastic and it can sort of make the lens opaque so you can't see through it very well. It started happening on this car, weirdly enough, more so in one specific place. So I paid someone to sand them back, polish them, and put some clear coats on them to protect them, and they come up beautiful. That was getting on for, no, a year and a half ago now, and they still look great. So that is lasting, that's well worth doing. It didn't cost that much money either. It cost me, well, he did me a good deal, because he does work for me, and uh, when I used to buy and sell cars, he used to do a bit more work for me, so he seems to give me a better deal. So I shouldn't say the price, but it's not that expensive to do it. You should be able to get it done for less than a couple of hundred pounds. It makes a big difference how the front of your car looks if you've got an older car that's starting to look a little bit ropey at the front. I just watched that clip back and it sounded like I said the paint guy used to work for me. That's not what I meant. I meant that he used to do a lot of jobs for me. I don't employ anyone. He's very successful. He has his own business. But when I used to buy and sell cars, quite often a car needed some kind of paint work doing and I'd get him to do it. So therefore, when I went there with my own thing, quite often he'd give me a good deal. A couple more reasons why I'm struggling to move this car on and go on to something else. One is the longer I have it, the harder it is for me to get rid of it. It kind of gets this sentimental value, which is a bit weird because it is just a car. And I don't usually feel that way about cars. I do enjoy them, I do like them, but I'm quite happy to sell the car and buy a different one. But with this one, it is getting a little bit harder. And the value of the car as well. I went onto Carwell yesterday just to see what they would offer. I would sell it myself because I would get a lot more money if I sold it myself, but they were offering 2,600 pounds, which was about right, I thought. I was thinking it's probably worth about 4,000 pounds, this car. So obviously you trade it in for a lot less, if, unless you sell it yourself. But the car's worth so much more than that to me. I bought it for what was 20,000 pounds, basically minus a thousand pound dealer contribution. The car isn't any worse then, uh, or sorry, any worse now than it was then to me. It's still the same car, it does the same job, it's still in really good condition. In fact, it's better because it's got Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. And if I wanted to buy a new car in this class with the same level of kit, it would have a bit more kit these days because things have moved on, but not a huge amount. I'm looking at early 30s, 30 something thousand pounds. So this car to me is worth a lot more than anyone's ever gonna be willing to give me. So it's hard for me to move on from it. Also, I find it difficult 
to replace a car I bought new, you're gonna say I'm a snob now, but I do find this difficult. If I bought a car new, I find it hard to replace that with a car I've bought used. Because there seems to be like this different feeling between buying a new car and a used car. I've had this car for new, I've been the only owner, and that's never gonna change. And for me, that's never gonna change. As long as I keep it, I've been the only owner. And to buy a car that now I'm the second owner feels like I'm buying a car that's more used than this one, even though I've spent so much time, done so many hours and miles in it. It's a weird feeling, but that's why when I'm looking at cars, I'm automatically just looking at new cars. I'm not looking at used cars, which I probably should do because I get a much better deal. Because I've kept the car for 10 years, it's actually cost me less. And the longer I keep it, the less it's costing me because I'm dividing the cost of the car over more years. So it was 20,000 minus the 1,000 pound dealer contribution, that's 19,000 pounds. Divide that over 10 years, that's 1,900 pound a year. That's really good to have a brand new car. And the longer I keep it, the lower that figure is. And that's ignoring the residual value that it still has. It's worth probably about £4,000 if I sold it myself or £2,500-ish if I gave it to a dealer. And also I'm in this good position and I've been in this position for a while where I haven't got any finance agreement. I'm free to buy a car if it comes along when I like. So if a new car pops up and I go, ah, I like that, I want that, I can go and get that. But if I was to change the car now, when there's nothing really that attracts me that much, I'll tie myself into that car for a while. And if something else comes along, I won't be able to then switch. If I did, it would cost a lot because it's better to hold on to cars for longer. So you spread out the depreciation over a longer period of time as I've done with this one. If I buy a new car now and then something else comes out next year, I'm like one year into the new car. If I sold it then, well, that's gonna be a big hit. You're gonna be, well, you've lost a lot of money in one year if you do it that way. Maybe you're thinking this, all those repairs you've paid for, if you add them all up, would you have been better off buying a new car every three years like most instructors do? Most instructors don't keep their car longer than three years. Some do, but most don't. It's a trigger's broom. You've replaced so many things, it may as well be a new car. No, it's not. Most of the things I've replaced have been smaller ancillary items, uh, touch points in the car as well that wear from high levels of use. The major things that have been replaced, like the cylinder head and the steering rack, they were done under warranty. And as far as I can tell, they were a problem from new. They were a manufacturing or design flaw that they sorted out and replaced free of charge. So that would have happened anyway. But the reason why I know I've spent less money keeping this car than buying a new car is because when I finished paying the loan on this car, I kept putting those payments into an account and I thought, okay, well, I'll just keep putting the money to one side and things that go wrong, I'll use that money to fix it. But the amount it cost for me to fix it was far less than the money I was putting away to the point where some of that money was used to fund my MX-5, a brand new 30,000 pound car. In fact, a lot of that car, quite a bit of it was funded from the money I've saved from looking after and keeping this car in good condition. And it's not like I'm driving around in some rickety old thing that's falling apart. It genuinely does feel like a new car in here. It hasn't been that difficult to keep the interior looking fresh. I've also saved money in servicing because when it was out of warranty at 90,000 miles, I didn't see the point in paying for expensive services. The value of the car meant that, yes, I could probably keep the value of the car a little bit higher by paying a lot of money for services, but if I service it myself, it's not gonna lose that much value a bit, but I'm gonna get more. I'm gonna save more from servicing it myself than I am gonna lose in the value of the car. So that saves me about 200 pounds a year servicing it myself and the car tax and this is only 30 pounds a year and if i was to get a new car that's going to be closer to probably 150 to 200 pounds a year so i'm saving 300 plus pounds a year in servicing and car tax just by keeping this let alone how much money i'm saving in the fact that i'm not buying a new car again and having to suffer that first three years of depreciation of course i could get around all of this just by buying a three-year-old car 
But as I've explained, I find that quite difficult after owning a new car. When I'm editing this video, I'm gonna figure out how much money I've spent on repairs. That's not going to include servicing because you have to service a new car anyway. It's more expensive actually new cars to service usually. I'm not going to include tires and brakes or a clutch. One, I never needed to replace the clutch on this car. I just did it because it was tapping. It wasn't worn out. Two, you have to pay for tires and brakes with new cars anyway, particularly if you're doing a lot of miles because you do get through them. So it makes no difference whether it's new or used. What I am going to include is things I've had to fix, things I wouldn't have had to change if it was a new car. And that includes this interior, me replacing the steering wheel and the seats. On screen is how much money this car, keeping this car has cost me in repairs. I don't know what that is. now. I've had to pay for repairs for just under seven years because it's warranty expired just over three years when it hits 90,000 miles. So I will divide that figure by seven to give a yearly cost. No idea what that is, I'm gonna guess. I'm guessing it's 1,800 pounds a year. How wrong am I? I don't know, I'll find out when I'm doing the edit. But I do know this. That is less than the yearly depreciation of buying a new car every three years. If I was to replace this car right now, there are two cars on my shopping list. The first one is a GR Yaris. Yes, I know, a totally unnecessary car for driving lessons. Now I say unnecessary, not inappropriate because yes it's a powerful car but in my experience teaching someone in a powerful car is not harder than in a car with low power in fact it's easier because often they're more flexible what i do find more challenging and i know many instructors would challenge me on this is diesel i find teaching in a diesel more challenging and that's because they have masses of very low down torque and as a result they do not work well if you get one gear out. So what I mean is if you go one gear wrong, quite often a diesel will jump up and down, punch you in the face, throw its toys out of the power, and go rup, 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 and when it stalls, rup, boom, like that. Whereas in a petrol, if my pupil gets one gear out, it kind of just vibrates a bit, and I go, oh, look, you got the wrong gear, put that in second, or whatever they need to do. So I have found, and I taught in diesels for six years, teaching in a petrol far more relaxing and it's less likely to spook my pupil. So difference between powerful and not powerful, I'm not really fussed when it comes to teaching. More power is probably a bit easier. Difference between petrol and diesel, I much prefer petrol, especially as you don't really have that advantage in diesel these days at the heart of the store because petrols are also very hard to store, including this car, which is 10 years old. But the reason why I probably wouldn't get a GR Yaris is because it's got quite a firm ride. I haven't actually been in one to be fair, but I'm assuming it's got quite a firm ride. But the stats on paper make me very attracted to that. It has a manual handbrake as well, so I'd still be able to teach people how to use a manual handbrake. Yeah, I should just go and get one, shouldn't I? But no, I think the ride, I don't want to be teaching people in a car the firm ride. If it has a good ride, then I'll be very attracted to that. I just want one basically, and I don't want to get rid of my MX-5 because I love having a convertible. I do like driving with the roof off. I don't want to replace that. So what can I replace? Well, this is the only other car I have. I could replace this. I don't want to have another car. That's even more cleaning and costs and servicing to deal with. The other car, more realistic car that I probably would get though, is a Mazda 3 Saloon because I like the look of them. I like how smooth they are, how they drive. Really lovely, easy gear change. I think learning one of those would be a pleasure. Problem is, it has a, an electronic handbrake as most cars have these days. Ha, let's just go and get the GR Yaris. As time goes on, my car choice does actually get more and more limited because automatics are starting to replace many manuals. Golf GTI, for example, at the moment, you can't get that in a manual, and I'm sure the normal versions of Golf soon you probably won't be able to get in a manual either. And I, I enjoy teaching manual. That's what I like doing, so that's why I need a manual car. And as less cars are manual, it means I have less choice. 
but the GR Yaris is manual. Since owning this car, I have recorded all of my fill ups and how many miles I've done. I think I've missed like a couple in 10 years. So I've got some very accurate figures here for you. I have spent a total of 31,000 and 12 pounds and 65 pence in petrol. And my average fuel economy across the whole term of having it, minus a couple of tanks of fuel, is 36.5 miles per gallon. And I've used 25,497.56 liters of fuel. Well, that was probably quite a long video. I don't know how long it is. I'll find out when I edit it, but 10 years of ownership, I had a lot to say. You may be thinking there's a lot gone wrong with this car because when you take 10 years and 19,000 hours and condense it into a video and say everything that's ever happened, it's gonna sound bad, it's always gonna sound bad. But most of the things that have gone wrong are small and the major things that went wrong, went wrong under warranty because it was a newly released model. I'm very happy with how much money I've spent on maintaining this car. I think it was a brilliant decision keeping it, one of my better decisions. It saved me a lot of money and I've enjoyed teaching in it. I enjoy the ride, it's smooth, the seats as well, that makes a big difference. I just find these seats comfortable and as a result, I like sitting in it and I can sit in it for a long time. And I find teaching in it quite easy as well. It's a very forgiving car, it goes very slow in second gear. It gives you plenty of warning before it stalls and it won't jump up and down like I said other cars do. It will sort of just shake a little bit and it helps my pupils learn. So I really do enjoy teaching people in this car. It's, it's quite easy. Um, I don't think I've got much else to say now. So I guess I should say thank you for watching. Give it a like if you like the video. Subscribe to get my future videos. And until the next one, cheerio.